This is Chase. And joining me today, um, I'm honored to have you here, um, Hap Klopp, president of, uh, uh, former president of the North Face. And, and really, the North Face that we know and love, um, I think you can trace back to, to Hap's leadership. Um, and, and your tenure with the company. So I, I'm, I really appreciate you taking time uh, to go through the history a little bit, your experience in the industry, and maybe we'll touch on kind of your thoughts of where the industry is at right now. But thanks for taking some time. I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Chase. Glad to be here. I hope I can add something of work. Well, I, I'm sure you will. I mean, just in the little bit that we've talking, I've we've been talking, I've already learned so much um, just about your experience in the industry. But um, as I was mentioning beforehand, this, this is a part of our history of gear series, and we're really just trying to document the history of this industry um, that, I, that I think we both love very much. Um, and, and I just want to you know, get on the record. I know it's been written about and you've been on podcasts talking about your, your place in the industry, but wanted to, to cover a few topics today um, and maybe going back to how you got into this industry and, and why the outdoor industry. I mean, the outdoor industry back then uh, when you got into it, isn't what it is today. Um, what what was kind of the state of the industry and what was your introduction to, to the outdoors? Well, my introduction to the outdoors is when I grew up. I grew up in Spokane, Washington. And that's what you did uh, one weekends. It wasn't professional sports or anything like that uh, of note. And it was just natural to go out. So it was something that I was always comfortable with. And, and ultimately, uh, I decided... I ran a family company because my father died while I was in school. And I uh, decided that I, having run that, I was going to sell it because it, did, it was wood products, made windows and frames, sash and door and things like that. And it didn't look like our company could compete with the companies out there. So while I applied to go back, uh, got a Stanford MBA. And while I was getting the MBA, I ran the company and negotiated the sale. And at the same time uh, was drinking some beer, which was what I was good at. Uh, and so I decided that what I would really do was focus on, once we'd sold the company, was focus on getting a, a job that would be meaningful and that would incorporate many of the ideas which I had, which was, you know, I believed in sustainability. I didn't believe in planned obsolescence, which was the nature of the day. I believe that women should be paid the same as men. I believe you should hire people irrespective of where they came from or what their sexual persuasion was. I didn't see that in a lot of businesses, but I wanted to find a company doing that. And I had the foolish belief that somebody would ask me to run their company because if I had a Stanford MBA, if I had run a company for a few years, uh, I was natural that somebody would pick that up. Well, nobody did. And, and I had a a few interviews with large companies, Procter & Gamble's the one that sealed the day, that convinced me that they weren't doing any of the things that I wanted to do. And so what I, I said is, well, if I, if I can't work for anybody else, then I need to actually start a company of my own or develop a company of my own. And I would do it around something I know something about and uh, be able to develop it. And so uh, a natural was the out of doors and, and there were some companies at that time were developing that way. So after I finished my MBA, I, I did a little bit of uh, consulting while I was developing a business plan. I worked for the ski hut for a while and helped them uh, through some financial problems they had and then tried to uh, go uh, develop this plan and move forward. What I concluded at, as I developed my plan was what we were thinking about was going to be quite different. It was going to be disruptive and, and evolutionary. And as a result of it, I didn't know how long it would take until others would pick up on the idea uh, because new ideas that are novel are not adopted instantaneously. So, uh, so what we decided to do was acquire a couple of stores that would give us some cash flow. And those stores were the North Face, started by Doug Tompkins. Uh, and they hadn't grown very much. I mean, we thought it was big at that time, it was 300,000 in sales. Uh, and it was primarily down his skin. And so the idea was we take those stores, sell some of our own products, sell other product that existed, whether it was pitons or, or climbing ropes or whether it was day packs from Europe or whatever. And gradually, as our line developed, we would be able to build the a company around it. And we opened up 
uh, a third store right away and made the back half of it into a manufacturer. So the, the name was there. We had to develop a logo. We had to develop a product line. We had to develop all those other things, but that was the idea of what we were going to do. And then coupled with that is I believe that what we needed to sustain it was a brand. We developed a brand uh, the way I always develop brands still do today in the consulting where I help people out was basically the idea of finding three words that are the ones that cut across everything you do so that every time you touch somebody in the outside world is touched in the same way with the same concept and thought. And those three words that we had were uh, disruption, quality, and triple bottom line. Triple bottom line being an equal commitment to profits, the planet, and uh, to people. And disruption was we took materials from the Vietnam War and we applied them to general camping. We took aircraft aluminum, made tent poles and pack frames, and we took parachute cloth and made sleeping bags and tents and some really funky clothing and thereby lightening the load. And then we constantly would do that in terms of materials. We wanted the first uh, to utilize Gore-Tex and contrary to the popular thing, if it's waterproof breathable, we liked it because it allowed us to make ski gear uh, for some of the extreme skiers that wanted slim fitting gear that wouldn't have a lot of air going through it. Uh, it didn't keep them totally warm, but you know, the primary thing that was, was cooling them off was the high winds that they had. And to do the acrobatics they wanted to do, Scott Schmidt, Egan Brothers, whatever, they needed something close fitting. So Gore allowed us to do that. And then we took it into the waterproof breathable categories as well. And, and likewise, then when our tent sales slowed down, I went to Buckminster Fuller, who is this philosopher genius that I knew through my, some of my friends who developed the concept of geodesics and whatever. And I said, Bucky, you say that geodesic structures uh, encompass a maximum amount of space with the minimum amount of materials. And it sounds like a, a backpacking tent. And he said, yes, it could be. And we asked him, you know, would you design for us in my time changing the world? But uh, if you put a team together, I'll mentor them and, and we can do it. Well, we had people who loved Bucky, who followed in one person, Bruce Hamilton, actually taken a year off to follow him around the world. Mark Erickson loved him. We located in Berkeley where there were a lot of people that got into it. So we revolutionized that way. But the disruption was not solely in the concept of product because our business model from day one was novel. We were omni-channel, which today is pretty normal. But at that time, it was heresy. People said, well, you can't sell through your own stores and sell wholesale. And we said, well, we can. We had our own catalog, which is a forerunner of e-commerce and whatever. So we're omni-channel that way. We ultimately ended up having an employee stock ownership plan where every employee owned a, a portion of the company while we ran it. So we were disruptive in that way. And then quality, uh, we underscored it by basically having a lifetime warranty, which I believe was the most environmental statement that existed out there. I believe a, a product which never ends up in landfill is the best thing, better than made from recycled materials. And so that was where we focused on that quality. We recognized that a product that lasts for a lifetime had to be made more uh, bulletproof as we called it. And in doing that was probably gonna be more expensive and the materials we were choosing more uh, durable than others that are out there. And it precluded us from certain areas where we could go into it. I mean, the story that I tell people, which most people don't realize, is we didn't sell a lot of day packs. And the reason we didn't sell a lot of day packs is sometimes they were school packs and whatever. Our products were designed to last for a lifetime. And the last thing the kid in school wanted was a pack that cost a lot of money that would last forever. They want a new one all the, all the time. And their parents would want one that would be reasonable. And so we adhered to that, and that sort of precluded us from an area that companies like Jansport did it, Eastpac did a good job, all of those. But because we adhered to these strategies, to what we did, we persevered. And then our commitment to triple bottom line, and the first thing, of course, was environment. Lifetime warranty is that way, but we backed many of the, uh, the movements there. We sponsored the, the first trip to go up Everest that actually brought back more trash than they took there. We created a novel uh, thing. I was worried that when we preached what we believed in, because in Berkeley, everybody preached about sustainability and environment and whatever, but it didn't resonate in, as globally as you might think as it does right now. But what we decided to do 
was use a little jujitsu on the marketplace and have a negative award with had a little bit of humor in it. And that award we called the Ice Nine Award. And it basically came from uh, Kurt Vonnegut's writing. He's an American humorist and one of his book, Cat's Cradle, he uh, wrote about this scientist who had the great invention. Uh, the invention would convert all of the water in the world into ice. And of course he recognized that would destroy the world uh, but it was such a great invention, he had to continue to take it to that level. So in his honor, we each year awarded the ICE-9 award to the most environmentally destructive individual or organization in the United States. And, and in one year, we gave it to the U.S. Congress. And of course, they had a lot of aides writing me saying, you don't know what you're doing. We are saying, yes, we do know what we're doing. It's exactly underscoring what we stand for. And of course, that's how you build a brand. So that was a way to bring some humor into it, not be so preachy, but still stay tied in two to the environmental position. And, and we followed that on everything we did. We took strong positions, anti-war position. Uh, we gave over a thousand tents for people that marched all the way across the United States. And that was a big thing for us. We couldn't afford it at that time, but we couldn't afford not to. And then our hiring practices were such that we did the things which I didn't like other people not doing. Uh, we hired and we paid the women the same as men. We uh, hired people that are respected for where they came from and spoke 14 different languages at all times, uh, languages or dialects, uh, so that people from wherever they came could work for us. And we hired people who are gay. We didn't care. Uh, as long as they're the best people in the world, that was what we did. It seems like so much of what you're doing is kind of, I guess, in the outdoor industry, it's it's what every outdoor company seems to strive for, right? And is it a, is a bare minimum in a, in a lot of cases for the, the brands right now? And you were doing this in that 19, well, 1966 is when the North Face started, but when you came 68. in and, and bought them out with 68. Um, I mean, incredible that, that you were leading in, in these areas, um, you well, know, we, and, and we, we're still, you know, people now are, that's the bare minimum of, of what people expect. Well, we believe we were going to change the world. And it was in Berkeley, you kind of thought one person could change the world. And, uh, that was the time, if you think about it, Mario Savio started the free speech movement. And he was an individual there and you could, you could see the impact he had. And we were anti-war and we could see that. But at, at the same time, what we really saw was uh, in writings like Thoreau's writing, where he wrote in Wilderness is the Preservation of the Earth, we believe that's what we could do. We could take people and get them out of the urban milieu that existed there, get them back to some standards that were really meaningful and that they would come back and they would be committed to taking care of the earth, taking care of society in a more meaningful way. And so we, we believe that we would make the products that would allow people to then change the world. It's that's an interesting theme I, I see in in a lot of the companies that we've uh, well the histories that we've covered um, in our previous episodes. Jerry Cunningham um, yep. leaving the East Coast to to go to the mountains to start an outdoor company, and and his mm -hmm. professors thinking that was a crazy idea, and that he would never be able to do that. Um, even on a small scale, we we talked about Rivendell uh, Mountain Equipment um, or Mountain Works, Larry Horton going to, to the Tetons, right? And building his own um, Lord of the Rings fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and building a company at the base of the, of the Tetons, right? This kind of idea of escape. Um, how much of a, a theme do you see, you know, in previous companies, in, in the founding of the North Face, this idea of kind of an escape? Well, a lot of it is an escape. You know, I think we were trying to get away from what existed there. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that Berkeley was we, we were more taking people up to Yosemite or moving in that region rather than totally walking around Berkeley in our gear. Uh, but the type of people that congregate in some of those areas, whether it was Boulder or Seattle or whatever, one, constituted a pretty good market. Two, constituted a great group of people on which you could draw to develop a company because people of a like mind. It isn't that you go out and try and convince died and ruled uh, business people who were working in standard ways to come join your company. You really had to find people who, who got it, who understood what we were trying to do, understood the value of the outdoors, understood what that stood for, and, and saw it as a, a calling as opposed to just a job. 
And we often joked about, you know, we were the last resort of employment for many people because they didn't fit anywhere else. So, you know, when they found us, they, they were happy to work with us. And in Berkeley, you had a lot of those misfits. What, what were some of your inspirations um, when it came to product? When you were, you know, you came in, started um, working with the North Face, ended up buying the company. What were some of the products, um, other companies that inspired you or influenced you when well, you were getting into this space? The, the people who were dabbling in there, some ski hut, as I mentioned, uh, Dick Kelty, who was uh, one of the first to use aircraft aluminum, making them in, into uh, pack frames. Uh, he was right there and worked right next to uh, the uh, aircraft industry and developed it and it was there. Uh, certainly when you see some things that Holy Bar did, Roy Holy Bar, uh, in terms of, you know, they were way too big and heavy in terms of, of down. You didn't need them for where we were sending people but they were great products. That, that was an inspiration that we saw out there. Uh, even uh, the idea of Eddie Bauer, where they were making uh, jackets for the military in the Second World War that existed out there that, uh, that was really inspirational, what, what we saw. Uh, and I would say that as time evolved, you're, you're inspired. The whole industry uh, fed on one another. It was more of a, a non-Malthusian thinking that existed in the industry at the outset. Now it's a little bit different and people are more competitive, but we always believe the philosophy that I had, the difference between pie slicers and pie enlargers. You know, the pie slicers think that pie, the pie is finite and what I get, I take from you, or conversely, what you get, you take from me. The pie enlargers are people that believe that if we have great ideas, the market's going to expand for everybody. And that's what the industry was about. So there, there was a lot of camaraderie, a lot of sharing. I mean, I can remember times when we ran out of goose down and we'd go down the street to see our design and they'd have some, or conversely, we'd give them that. Or, or if we needed excess materials and there wasn't any webbing around or YKK had run out of providing zippers, which they did on a regular basis, people would share. Again, that may be tied a little bit to the calling that we weren't just trying to develop a business. We were trying to uh, alert people to a way of living that we thought was going to change the world. I, I love that idea of the the expanding the pie and and it seemed like you know the industry has kind of adopted that and and is still I, I think in some ways still thinking that and we're seeing that um, I think mostly when there's or there's ideas or values of the industry that are being threatened it seems like the industry is really good at coming together to support each other and fight for a common a common goal and and maybe that can be traced back um, even back to Jerry Jerry and and the holy bars I, I can't remember which was which but you know, one of the families helped the other family build their home, right? In, in, in Colorado, right? That idea of, okay, well, we're competitor companies, but I'm going to help you build your house, right? Uh, and maybe there's something that, that can be traced back to that, that whole idea of collaboration and expanding the pie. Um, can, can you speak a little bit to the influence of, you know, we can see this in different regions of the country, especially these hot spots of, of gear, whether it's Denver or, you know, Denver, Boulder, Seattle, um, California, um, you know, what, what impact did the ski hut have on the industry? I mean, how significant was that? You know, obviously for you, that, that was significant. Um, but how significant was that for the region? Well, I, I think it was important, certainly because if you look at some of the companies and people who work there, CR Designs, uh, Class 5, uh, those people uh, came out of that and be able to develop that in different aspects. Uh, and, you know, so over time, and it was closely allied with the uh, Sierra Club, and which was also in the Bay Area. And I think one of the things that either tied to or, or promoted the growth of the industry itself that existed out here. And what you need for any industry to evolve is to have enough customers uh, that understand what you're doing to be, and we had that environment out there. And I think that the, the early providers were the ones that grew rather slowly uh, because there wasn't much market out there, but certainly started creating some awareness of the type of product that could be available. Yeah, it seems like that's that's a constant need um, for the industry even today. It's how do we educate new new consumers or new participants in the outdoor industry, right? Because if there's people, if there aren't people who are going out to recreate, they have no need for what we're creating. Um, 
and it seemed like Jerry Cunningham really adopted that early on with, mm-hmm. with making, you know, his, his materials on, on, uh, you know, how to layer and how to, um, how to keep warm and, um, you know, just kind of how a lot of how to's and, and the industry seems to still be doing that. Did the North face ever get into that? It's like how to's for how to, how to get outside and how to participate. Uh, some, uh, and, and we did a lot of, uh, things in the stores, you know, how you, how you pack a pack and that sort of thing, which uh, to those of us who've spent the whole life in the outdoors, many of those things seem kind of banal. Uh, you're going, of course, but when you're trying to expand the market, no, it's not, of course, but uh, people, people didn't understand it. So if you can facilitate that, uh, we didn't do nearly as well as REI did later on and on the how-to aspect. They really helped build the whole industry that way where, where we we did it modestly, but we were more trying to satisfy a group of people we knew that are out there that were kind of crazy. And then we tried to do things like we we're uh, one of the initiators of the concept of having athletes and as influencers for the marketplace. And we kind of thought that the activities that they did might inspire others to uh, maybe not go as far as they were going uh, geographically or to the heights that they were going, but certainly would inspire their thinking about the joy of the outdoors. Yeah, that's, and I'm glad you mentioned that. I mean, we're touching on so many things that the North Face led in and, and, and now seem just, you know, like the basics, right? Oh yeah. You need an influencer who can do, you know, climb the highest peak or, you know, um, it's so interesting to, to hear that. And um, at the same time, there's that balance of, um, you know, how do you, inspire people and have this aspirational marketing, but also not exclude the casual user. And, and I, I keep referring back, right. Like to the, to the Jerry's and he was always just trying to, you know, create products like the kitty carrier. How do you get just everyday people to be able to go outside in addition to cater to the people who are going to, you know, cl- climb the highest peak. So it seems like there's always that balance um, what, of inspiring what, and getting people out. One of the ways we tried to do it is we tried to get people who are very personable along with being great athletes. And we didn't always have, you know, the Reinhold Mesners of the world uh, who were doing just phenomenal things and selling those. Uh, we, we had people who were you know, going up Everest and we had people that, you know, one that rode from the tip of South America to the Antarctic, Ned Gillette. Uh, but we were doing crazy things, but they were people who we could take them into our stores and they would uh, give a presentation for a couple of hours and everybody would say, oh, I know that person. They're a good friend of mine. They're really good people. So we, we didn't look for them just because they were athletes. We looked, that was sort of the table stakes to get into the game. But what made them our, our athletes were those that could relate to other people. So that somebody who maybe would never climb Makalu uh, at the same time, though, would be inspired by the stories and get excited by uh, the people and, and sort of from rubbing elbows with people like that, thinking they're with National Geographic and they're ready to go. That that sounds all too familiar. I mean, something that I hear whenever I talk to people about the industry and why they want to be a part of it is that sentiment, right? It's, yeah. oh, these are just good people. Uh, mm-hmm. That seems like a common common thread um, that, that I've heard. Um, do, do you mind talking a little bit about um, the North Face starting to get into making its own products. You know, obviously the, the North Face was a retail store to start um, selling other people's products. What, what was the first foray into to making your own products? I, I mean, you, you mentioned, um, you know, Sierra Designs was helping in the creation of, of early products. What, what did that look like in the early days? Well, uh, the North Face stores, as I said, were primarily ski. 300,000 in sales and 210,000 of it was downhill ski. And we threw that all away. Uh, they did have some product made by Sierra Design under a different logo. Uh, I don't know how much I would uh, have to look, but the records are pretty spotty, but probably $20,000 worth of outdoor gear and whatever. My plan was to make gear from day one. So the first day that I got in, we started setting up a factory. And what we did was we started with two products. One was a pack, which was called the Roof Sack. And there was an independent designer, Stuart Ruth, who had a design of an internal frame pack. Uh, it was not external frame, which was Kelty, and it 
was not in that no frame, which was a lot of product out there. It was a way to carry a lot with an internal frame pack, which would allow you to access it with a lot of space inside. So that was a differentiated pack that we we're going to do. And then simultaneously, we made sleeping bags. So those were the first two products we had. And when we went around to try to sell them, as, as we guessed, a lot of people didn't get it. The, uh, Jack Gilbert, who, who joined me at the start, somebody I knew from Stanford, but uh, he went out on, he was a great salesman, he went out on the sales tour of the whole West Coast of every sporting goods store and came back with one order from Portland, Oregon for 14 sleeping bags. And uh, that was the start of where, you know, where we were. But we were selling you know, that number uh, weekly in our stores, which at the time seemed large, but it, it was not. And then we, as I uh, mentioned to you before we went on this, uh, we decided to, because we're going to have a lifetime warranty, that to sell these very satisfied customers, again, uh, they probably wouldn't need another sleeping bag for a while. Uh, what we had to do is make other products. So we moved into tents and clothing almost immediately, even though it was much more difficult to make four different types of products. Uh, but we didn't know enough about sewing to know how difficult it was, so it didn't daunt us. And, and we created all four of those categories within the first 18 months of where we were, but with emphasis on packs, uh, internal frame packs and sleeping bags at the outset. It's, you, you bring up a really interesting point of, you know, just the business model um, in the outdoor industry it can, can be challenging, right? And you can be faced with these, um, I just, this, this conflict, right? If, am I just making more stuff that's going to fall apart and contribute to the deterioration of, of the natural world around us? Or am I going to make good stuff, you know, quality product that's going to last a long time, but people are only going to buy one of those things from me and I don't have a viable business model at Don Wittenberger um, who, who started the Yak Works and then went on to, to buy Rivendell and is, is keeping that going. He said that was always the challenge for them, right? It's like we made good stuff and so people didn't come back to us. They only needed one, one of our packs and, and so it was really tough. How did you navigate that? You, you always found complementary products to, you know, someone would get one thing but then they needed to get other high quality items to complement that? How, how did you figure and, and crack that business model while also being true to this idea of we need to make good stuff so it doesn't fall apart and, and uh, negatively impact the environment? You're relying on word of mouth to be able to get the word out there. So, uh, the, you know, we always joked about the word of mouth. If you use uh, a great expedition to Himalayas as a promotion, how many people are they going to be talking to? Eight people on the mountain or whatever. So it's going to be kind of slow if you, if you grow that way. But our belief was, first of all, that we needed to sell them other product, which they would carry, so that that one individual who was satisfied would buy more from you, but they didn't necessarily replace something that existed out there. And, and so that was one approach. The second approach was that we tried to use influencers that were uh, telling worthy stories that would make people interested in good product and where they were going. And even if it was beyond the individual aspirations of the people going out there, it was pretty interesting and worthwhile hearing those stories. And so they'd be armchair travelers, they would be reading National Geographic, they'd be thinking as they were going out to the, uh, the, the Sierras that they were in the Himalayas uh, or whatever. But we believed by using influencers that people would listen to, it was there by uh, facilitating uh, a movement into other products that was there and then promoting that with people and then by building a brand. Most companies in the industry didn't build a brand and what they did was build a product and from day one I wanted to build a brand and so I had the concept of how you build a brand and it, everything we did was designed to sell the same basic functional aspects of what we were doing. There were three words we used that everybody came back to and we can constantly talk about them, quality, disruption, and triple bottom line uh, that we would use to develop our business. In doing that, every time we touched any point, whether it was a vendor that was supplying us, they knew what we stood for, whether it was a customer, they understood maybe why our product was high priced, but if it lasted forever, it was really value, not price that existed out there. Uh, every employee that came in knew what we stood for. By, by doing that, the impact of our brand reached a lot of people. It wasn't a shotgun approach. They saw very clearly, and some people said, well, it's not for me, I don't do that. And 
they joke and the only time I go camping is when I'm at the hotel. I go to a motel or something and he'd, he'd laugh and say, okay, you're not for us, uh, but the others that were there. But by building a brand, by having a product line that covered all of that, and by using influencers, we were able to get the story out. And then we use storytelling to be able to go on because uh, stories or parables has been used forever as a way to actually convey something. So by creating these stories about what you're doing, true stories, but stories that were out there, you would allow uh, people to tell others about this. So instead of just talking about a product, the story would be what they would reiterate. And of course, it becomes more powerful the, the further out it gets from you. Everybody's thinking you're a homie if you talk about your own product, your own story, but the second person, third person out there telling it, it gains credibility. And if it's crazy enough or wide enough, and I'll just give you one example of that, but uh, we were trying to show how we really cared more about our customer than anything else. And when you have a lifetime warranty, you have to either do a repair or replacement uh, based on what you can do. And, and so we had a warranty department and I always told them, make the customer happy. The faster you can solve their problem, the happier they're gonna be. And it doesn't matter what you do, if it takes three weeks or four weeks to solve it, they're not gonna be happy. But one day somebody came into our warranty department and I should said, yes, what is it? And they said, we've been planning our trip all year long and our tent has failed and it's gonna screw up our trip, we, we can't go. Well, where are you gonna go and when? They said, we're going this weekend. I said, well, I have capacity, we can, we'll fix it. And they said, well, there's one little problem that we didn't mention to you. It's not your product, it's your competitor's product. And she said, well, that's not a problem. They make great stuff and we know how to fix it and, and we have capacity, we'll get it done. They said, well, what's the cost? So there's no cost, we don't charge for warranty. And so they repaired it, people went out, they were happy, now they may have been scamming us, but the reality is if they told that story or others told that story, it really underscored what we stood for and how we stood behind our products and the type of company that we were. And so that was part of the brand building, but it was also part of the education and rolling the information out. I can't emphasize enough like how much like that idea is it, for some companies, they're just waking up to this idea of, oh, we should, we should offer a warranty or we should offer repair. And, and you were doing this in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, which is just amazing. For you, just, I imagine it was just common sense. It, it was. And, and it was, what, what did we want? You know, what, <laughs> the people that were going out hiking and camping, and whatever, what, what did we want in the way of a product? And we didn't want planned obsolescence. We didn't want all of those things. We want a product that lasted, a product that worked, a product that was designed by somebody that actually used it as opposed to having lots of bells and whistles. Uh, it had what was appropriate. Can you speak a little bit more to the brand itself? It, it's different where you weren't there to, to create the brand necessarily from the ground up or choose the name or, or anything like that. But um, you know, you kind of inherited the brand um, but you were able to create the brand and the logo that, that everyone knows and, and loves today and, it, and is so impactful. Can you speak to, to the creation of, of the logo and, and the new branding? Well, I mean, first of all, a brand is not a logo. A brand is not a tagline. Uh, a brand is not a name. A brand is all of those things that are reflected in that fashion. And then North Face was a good name. And we liked it because uh, it represented the people who were climbers. It represented the north face of the Eiger Mountain. And, you know, the north face is always the iciest and probably the riskiest. And so to somebody who was a real user, it had a meaning, but also was easily remembered by anybody else. So we liked that. It was a good choice. But building a brand is about putting all these things together in a consistent way, told repetitively, persistently, consistently. And where everybody measures themselves against those standards in the company. So when we went forward, the first thing we did is we they played around with a couple of ideas of different things, but none of them were uh, were what I would describe as very commercial. And so what we did effectively was in day one, we went there was a, a contact I had in San Francisco, and he. I said, well, we can't pay you very much. And he came in with 10 ideas. Uh, nine of them didn't work and one did work. And, and we said, we got to get it on a product because we're making it right away. 
And so that's how we did it. We paid $250 for it. Now, uh, Dave Alcorn, who, who did that, ultimately went on to become the head of, of uh, corporate design for Merrill Lynch. So he's probably pretty talented uh, and we were probably pretty lucky to have that. But the idea was we needed a logo. We did that and we put it on something as a way to do that. And then we attempted to immediately ensure that everything we did went against those three standards, which we said, was it disruptive? Was it high quality? Was, was it done in a way of triple bottom line? Triple bottom line was an equal commitment to profits, uh, to planet, to people. And by planet was environmentalism and sustainability and people had to do with social causes and supporting them. We were the first company uh, to get behind the AIDS movement, the knowledge uh, there because it was a thought of initially the homosexual disease and there was a lot of uh, sort of uh, dissing of people as a result of it as opposed to attacking the problem. And so we thought by educating, taking a macho company uh, talk about AIDS education, we were doing socially the right thing. And in terms of education, uh, in, in terms of the profits, none of the people we hired at the outset had any business training. Yet 11 of them went on to run other major companies in the outdoor business because I, I believe the way we did business, they were trained. I knew with the background I had, had run a business before having a Stanford MBA, that I knew how to train the business aspect. And we were looking for passion in two categories. One, a passion for the outdoors, and two, a passion to change the world. If that was the case, then we thought they were good enough that we could show them how to do business. I could show them how to do that. We developed that over time with that training. Uh, they were brilliant people and able to do those things, but whether it was Jack Gilbert who started Mountain Hardware, or Sally McCoy around Sierra Designs and then later Birkenstock, Bill Worland, who ended up running Patagonia International, or Missy Park, who ended up uh, doing Title IX and starting it, uh, Maggie Rival doing company life gear, uh, on and on. It was the training of how you do a business is something you can learn in business schools or you can learn by reading books. But understanding the out of doors, understanding the passion for it was what we were trying to grab as we did that. We believe that was part of building the brand. And then we started developing stories that represented each aspect of what we were doing, whether it was a quality story or whether disruption, disruption talking about taking materials from the Vietnam War and applying them to camping to lighten the load to take people miles into the wilderness was a story which we used to, uh, do, to carry that out. So day one, we worked on building a brand. Day one, we started making product of our own. Day one, we had a logo to put on it to sort of centralize the visual aspect of what you were doing. And then we built on that continuously, repetitively. What, what do you think about, um, in the outdoor industry, there's, there's kind of a long history of, of founders who come in with, without really any, um, maybe like formal education or, or training, uh, biz, business training or, um, you know, it's, it's the dirt bags, right. Who build a lot of these companies and that's, there's something to that. And that's, that authenticity is really important and, and it has helped contribute to the, the, uh, to the growth of, of a lot of the brands that we, we know today. Um, I mean, you, you had a passion for the outdoors and, and, and loved participating in outdoor activities. You came in with, with, you know, a business, you know, an MBA, um, and that education, um, do you do you think there's something different about companies that come in with a with a founder or or early um, you know a, a president early in the company with with that angle kind of a different perspective? I, I'm thinking of like a Jack Stevenson who was an aerospace engineer, right? Who just came at it from a different angle. Is there something to that 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 made the North Face different, where where you were able to come in with that formal business training? I I think so. Uh, you know, you have to probably test it. But the reality is almost all the people who started those companies were really brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, they just were sort of misfits. I mean, they either misfits or they were tinkerers that liked to do things and didn't like their gear or the way it was. Uh, but because they had just that sort of tinkerer's product focus, they didn't have the underpinnings for scaling a company. 
Now, we never thought we were going to scale it like North Face. North Face today's three billion in turnover, and that's you know that's that's a lot. We never aspired to that. We aspired to make enough product that everybody could live a good life. We could make a profit, and we could somehow change the world by getting people out there. But we didn't aspire to the levels that they have now. But what happens is is you need the people who are passionate to start that that create things later on. You say, well, you can bring them into your design department. Oftentimes, design departments, when they're very large companies, very little of that idea ever gets out because you know they don't want to obsolete existing products they have, or they, you know, it's too expensive to make, or it has certain criteria. Where you take the the dirtbag people starting up, they're making a product for themselves, and they define what the criteria is, eh? and oftentimes those are non-commercial ideas, uh, or in the the world, they would seem like non-commercial ideas, but they're going, you know, the only way I'm going to do this is my way. And then they end up making those products. And some of those companies grew, but an awful lot of them flattened out. And maybe partly because they, I wouldn't say disdained uh, business, but, but didn't want to submit to all of the things, all of the meetings and everything associated with, with a larger company that is far away from the joy of being in the wilderness. Hmm. No, that's, that's an interesting perspective. I, I thought you'd have a, a kind of a different angle at it coming from, from your background. Um, so I, you know, another question I had for you was, I mean, you, you grew the North face from a 14 person company to over a thousand. Yep. What lessons did you learn through that experience? And, you know, again, probably never thought that you'd get to that many employees. Um, you know, what, what did you learn through, through that experience scaling a company? Well, the hard part is when you have that many employees, uh, the way I manage it, you have an obligation to each one of those. And that's, that's darn hard uh, because you, know, you need, you, you know that they have a family, you know that they're relying on the income you have, you know that all the things changing in the world, uh, and, and let's take today's world where we are right now with COVID out there, there are people that have the same feeling that I had with a thousand employees and suddenly all the stores are closed and they can't do anything. You feel that as a personal obligation of somehow trying to keep those people afloat. And it's, it's very difficult to do. And so it, it becomes voracious in terms of its demands on you to be able to grow that company because it isn't just the products that you're producing out there. But, but the other one of course was what I learned, what I believe, but I learned more and more all the time is Every time you bring in a new employee, you have to work to make sure they understand what you, you stand for. You know, we were doubling every year. We were scaling like that. And double doesn't sound like very much when you go from 300,000 to 600,000 to a million to 2 million or whatever. But your, your employment grows at about the same level. And unless you do some guidance in helping people understand it, the new people will take you in new directions. And you only want to go in new directions if everybody's in agreement about this. And so what we had to have is every two years, we had to have what we call long range planning, where we get together and talk about the quantitative goals, but also the qualitative goals. And the people who have been around for a while said, you know, that's old stuff, the, you know, the qualitative goals, but the qualitative goals is what builds the brand. That's where the stories come from and how you develop that. And we had to pay strict attention to bringing people in, but not just be getting the best people, but then getting the best people who agree with the way we're going to do business. Because we weren't doing it every way, we were doing it our way. And there are other good ways to develop business with different concepts and different thoughts. We were high quality functional product and there's high quality fashion product and there's low quality, low price product and all of that, all serving different markets out there. So we'd have those meetings and get together. And inevitably at the end of long range planning, I would say the same thing, which sounded really banal to the people that been around, but it was pretty energizing to the new people where I'd say, now that we've decided on this, I hope some of you will leave the company. And I say that not because you aren't good, we hired you because we thought you were the greatest, but if you have ideas that differ from ours, what you have to understand is we aren't going to be pursuing those for the next couple of years. And I'd much rather you find a place that embraces your ideas and you'll be happy there rather than constantly have to fight us as we're going forward because the company can only have 
one set of culture and one set of direction. And people did leave. And some people actually left and then came back and we were there. But that was the sort of thing that it, it could take on a life of its own if you didn't control it as you grow. And a lot of companies uh, don't do that and you, they lose their impact. Companies that do do that, you know, and, and a good example would be Patagonia that has the, you know, the influence of Yvonne Chouinard, even when Yvonne is not in there every day, as he loves to say, but the influence of that is so strong that that consistency is there and they aren't going in a new direction because they have a new great employee or they aren't going in, in 10 directions. What, do you mind sharing a little bit about um some of the key innovations, the key products um, during your yeah. tenure. I, you, you touched on, on the dome tent. Um, do you mind sharing a little bit about some of the, or, the origins of some of those key items and, and maybe some of the influence that, that's still felt by those today? Well, the, the products which we did the least amount of work on initially was all of the clothing. And we, we were sort of imitating the mountain parka that existed out there and some others. And it was only when some revolutionary materials started coming out that we really were able to develop things like the downfill jacket, and lightweight jacket, and what you have. The biggest innovation was, was the uh, geodesic tent that we talked about, but that was a combination of things. It was not just the tent. The tent required us to come up with a new tent pole because the way you bent a pole uh, would infest impact the amount of stress that was out there. So we had to go out and find purveyors of materials that might fit there. And we ended up striking a relationship with East End Aluminum, which till that time had been making arrow shafts and baseball bats and, and poles for uh, ski poles. And we went to them and said, this is our idea. They developed that idea. So we actually uh, worked with them to be able to come up with it. Otherwise you wouldn't have been able to have a, tent, a pole that would bend in that radius and that thinness and it'd go out there and, and develop that. So that helped us move in that direction. As we were talking about trying to develop some of the clothing we had, then we started looking at new materials that existed out there that really did it. And initially we went to a zipper uh, in uh, Switzerland called Opti, which was a coil zipper that allowed you to go through curves without any teeth splaying, which is really a unique way to go out there. And we had to invent that way. They, they made it that way and we found that its application was really good where a tooth zipper would not act in that same way. So if you tried to put it in a tent or you tried to put it in clothing where you're going over shoulders or whatever, that wouldn't exist out there. So we started creating that. And then of course, we, because there were so many uses, we really started working on the layering concept of working together and introduce those products. So we'd have a shell jacket and then underneath it, we'd have a base layer. Later on, mid-layer came up, but it was really kind of the two. Well, finally, when we got into the, the mid-layer and we developed the Denali product, which to this day was the hero product that they had out there, it really was one of the quintessential examples of what you need on a product which could be used as a mid-layer or in, in other weather, uh, you could use as an outer layer as long as you didn't worry about the wind coming through it. And then, of course, the application of Gore-Tex uh, helped us really apply a lot to our products. I said initially it allowed us to get into skiing and to make a jacket, which was sort of windproof, so we could do the people like the Scott Schmidt and the Egan Brothers, who were initially up at Yosemite doing all these acrobatics. They could do that because it was a close-fitting garment. But then we worked with them to elaborate on making waterproof, breathable garments that were made with the, uh, the Gore-Tex benefits that existed out there. And, and developed all of the aspects there, worked with them in their labs to make sure that nothing would leak on the product that you have to be able to develop them. It, it seems like a, a lot of people think that innovation, you know, is, is the invention of a new product entirely or a new product category or, um, but it seems like more often than, than not, it's, it's the creation of a new process. And yeah. kind of what you're describing, right? It's a new application of an existing material or applying a new material to, to a, a, a product that, you know, hadn't incorporated that material previously. I think a lot of us get that confused, or at least I do at sometimes, you know, you think, oh, I've got to create a product that's never existed before. Well, no, maybe you have to create a new process, um, yeah. you know, to create a new material or new application. 
your observation is good. And I think it's connecting a lot of dots. And some of the great designers say, well, gee, if I could take that, that and apply it here in a little bit different form or different color or different whatever, that would work pretty well. As I said, when we used the tent poles, we knew what we needed in the way of a pole didn't exist out there, but we kind of knew where it was going, but there, we could not have afforded, nor could have anybody else in our uh, afforded to develop all of the aluminum capability to be able to do that. But there are others working there uh, with similar technology and concepts. So by marrying the two and bring them together, it's really how the, the design would work. And it, it's sort of outsourcing. I mean, even when we had we had some problems with the tent poles because there's stress corrosion cracking. We went to the University of California and they said, well, you know, we've seen this before in airplane wings. And so by utilizing some of that and then going to Bucky Fuller and talking to him about his ideas. So it's a collaboration of those ideas to be able to come up with what it is. The concept, of course, is unique of putting them together, but, but trying to, in an industry as small as ours, and even today as small as it is, you can hardly afford to develop all of the materials all the way back to come up with an entirely new concept. Maybe you could do one aspect of that, but the rest of it, you're going to have to rely on bringing in uh, disparate materials or disparate processes uh, to be able to produce it, or you're just not going to be, you'll ever get to market. Uh, you'll have the greatest idea and it'll never be there. Yeah, I think of, of again, a Jack Stevenson of Warmlight right, coming with an aerospace background and being able to innovate on the A-frame tent, right? Everything had largely been A-frame and, and then being able to introduce an art, you know, the elliptical arch, mm -hmm. uh, the tunnel tent um, that was more aerodynamic. Yeah. Um, you know, it, that only comes when you're, you come from a different discipline and, and, and come at it with a different perspective. And, and I think that's part of why I asked you from a business perspective, you know, what are some of those different perspectives that you came with, uh, you know, having slightly different training than most, so. One of the things that I always uh, tell people is all of the great ideas come in the valleys between disciplines. Uh, if, if it's the same people talking with the same people all the time, you won't have breakthroughs, but you get two people with, with different backgrounds and different approaches, and they start talking about a problem, and they both realize they're working on that problem from a different perspective and together they could come some up with something entirely new and so it's a real tribute uh, to development to be able to somehow get people together who, who talk with different languages and have different attitudes and different approaches to be able to sit down and talk about a common problem and then come up with a solution but when you do that you really can have some breakthrough products well, I'm, I'm going to jump a, ahead uh, a little bit. Um, I mean, to kind of mid eighties um, yep. is when the company ends up selling, right? It was 1988, Eight, 88. What, what went into some of those decisions and, and that decision ultimately to, to, to sell the company? Well, I, you know, I would attribute it to having probably the, the wrong business model. The, the model that we had, Every time we grew, we had to uh, raise more money. In the, in the traditional way that the business was run, the business model, you could only grow 20% a year on internally generated funds. And uh, then if you went beyond that, you either had to get more support from the bank or equity, and you kind of go back and forth, more bank and then more equity. As a result, we were constantly, we, you know, we were doubling every single year. And so we were constantly uh, looking at uh, fundraising. And uh, a real fundraising, as you get larger in company, takes you about six months uh, to be able to accomplish it. Well, uh, so every two years, I was spending six months basically fundraising. And when you bring new people in, some other people want out, then you've got, just like you have to get your employees on board about what's the right way to go and what do we stand for, you have to do the same thing with investors that you're bringing and not everybody agrees and you got to get everybody on there. So now you're spending six months trying to get the funding done and then you're spending another three months trying to get them uh, aligned with what you're doing and you're almost on to the next one. And so it ends up with a lot of time being spent on things which are either negative or friction or arguments or uh, doing things that we never wanted. And, you know, I never wanted to be an investment banker. And, and after I did one fundraising round, which raised $10 million, 
uh, and 10 million was big for us at that time. In today's world, a lot of people don't think that's so big, but it sure seemed like it to us. But one of the people on the board came to me and he, he said, Have you, you know, you're, you're, you've accomplished it, you're doing what you said, but you know, you'd also said that, you know, when it wasn't fun anymore, uh, you're going to get out of the business. And it sure doesn't look like this is fun anymore to be able to do all those things when what you really want to do is train people and develop new products and spend time out of doors. And, you know, instead you're being in a poorly paid investment bank. I, I kind of concurred and I, I didn't want some of the battles which we had that were, uh, you know, trying to convince everybody to do it in our way. But I knew that that was essential to building the brand. So the, the company ends up selling in 88. Um, yep. You know, what, what, what was the, the next chapter like for you? Um, you know, what, what were you looking forward to post the North Face? Well, I went skiing, uh, which I hadn't been able to do very much uh, previously, which I really wanted. I also uh, got involved in writing some books. I've written two books, one called Conquering the North Face, which is uh, basically about leadership in the North Face and, and the industry as we spoke. Uh, and it was fun to write that and be able to carry that out. I was going to say, I, I, we, you got it up on the bookshelf right there. <laughs> and uh, then I did some consulting as well, uh, which I want to do because even, as I mentioned, you only can do your, run your business in one way, but there are other ways to run business. But you've got to make sure you don't explore those on, on your own company or you slow it up. So it was able to take some of those ideas and apply them to other companies and be able to, uh, to see what I could do. So I would serve on some boards, larger companies or whatever, consulted some with other people and ended up doing some teaching, uh, which was kind of what I was doing when I was at the North Face, but on a little different line. And, and I still to this day teach, uh, I teach at Holt University, teach global business practice and, and uh, things like global product development and what have you, but also at Stanford, Cal, uh, MIT, Carnegie Mellon, doing some things about entrepreneurship, doing things about innovative uh, approaches to business. Well, what are your, some of your thoughts on, on the industry right now? I mean, obviously the industry is going through, well, and the world is going through um, a lot of changes. Um, I guess, wh where do you see the kind of the state and, of the industry currently and, and the future of the industry? I, I, I think there could be a rebirth. Uh, if, if you would describe when I went through it as a birth of the industry, uh, what we were looking at at that time uh, was urban uh, degradation, things falling apart. We had the Vietnam War, we had people battling in the streets, we had in Berkeley, uh, there, you know, there were riots going on and, uh, and on and on. And, and the dissatisfaction we saw, we were trying to solve. It's not dissimilar to what we see right now, where if you, you go to the wilderness, you're going to come up with the, the right preservation. Of, of the earth. That's how we're going to get back. Uh, the way we're going right now, society is not sustainable. Uh, the income inequality that exists, the marginalization of people that exists. Uh, if you look at, at uh, what's happening, uh, it is it is a not a sustainable path. So what is a good path? Well, a good path is one that's more in harmony with nature. It's about sustainability. It's about appreciating nature climate change and, and understanding the impact that has doing something to arrest that. I, I believe that the industry can, which addresses that is going to be properly positioned. The reality is that with COVID uh, and you look around, a lot more people are biking. A lot more people are going out hiking or walking, depending on you know how extreme they want it to be. And certainly what's going to come from this is a lot more people realizing that maybe it isn't getting on an airplane and traveling that is really great. You can actually go to the wilderness nearby and have that same energizing feeling that exists. And so I think properly stewarded by our industry, if, if we do it, what you will find is a rebirth based on the same exact things that launched the industry when we started, but now predicated on a new set of problems that exist out here uh, in, in a big way, which is climate change and the impact of that based on urban problems that exist, based on the fact that you need uh, to be better uh, stewards of business and stewards of the area. So I'm an optimist. I, I think 
that this will, will lead to a lot of people uh, recognizing those of us who know it, know it, but a lot of people who didn't know it are going to start seeing it with the eyes that we have. Well, and you'd think that this industry is positioned really well. There's, there's more companies with, with really great values that, and those are values that were built upon, um, you know, the, the companies that, 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 you know, the North face that you built, um, you know, previous companies that espouse those same values. So you've, you've got a couple generations now that have similar values. You'd think that there could be some momentum behind that. Um, and that companies would be well positioned to, like you said, kind of use this to move the industry forward in a more positive direction. Well, I think they're also large enough to, to uh, make an impact on, on the world, on other companies. When people see that they're successful, adhering to these strategies, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of companies that are flailing around, wondering what, what's the way of the future. And when we were very small, people laughed at us, you know, granola people, tree huggers, you know, dirty fingernails, you know, they don't have any money, you know, whatever, dirt bags, all, all of those things that existed, but uh, we probably didn't influence nearly the way that the companies can now, because they can be looked at as proper economic engines for other companies to emulate what they're doing. And when they start focusing, as the industry has on sustainability, uh, that has an impact across other consumer goods that exist out there. And when you have people speaking uh, about issues, uh, Patagonia again, Yvonne Chouinard, when he stands out about Bear's Ear, whatever, people listen. Uh, and that's because of, of the success, the success and the, uh, and the respect that is there. So the, the thing that is different from when we started the industry is those companies that exist in it do have a larger platform. And with the new media, whether it's social media, whatever, that word can get out to millions or tens of millions of people and have an impact. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see kind of the, the new direction of the industry and where things go. But I, I, I'm with you. I, I'd like to stay optimistic about the future of this industry. Um, as you look back on, on your career and, and particularly your time at, at the North Face, what did you learn about yourself through that whole experience? Anything you learned about, about yourself as, as a person, as a leader? Yeah, you know, you never lead anybody. You know, they, they follow what they want to do. What you need to do is figure out what they want and then position yourself that way. Uh, people are great, but despite the fact that you think that you know where, what they want, unless you ask them, you don't learn very much. And I, the other thing is that people don't hear what you say. They only remember about a third of it, no matter how good, how articulate you are and what you present. What people remember is the passion that you bring to what you're doing. And passion is what speaks when you're out of the room. And if you're trying to motivate a lot of people, count on the fact that they're, they want to know if you're really going to be there, if you're really uh, what you say, or if it's just a game. And people are pretty good at reading whether it's true or not. And so if you're truly passionate, it comes across to them. And if you're consistent, it comes across to them. And that's how you build a team. Oh, I love that. I, I think that's a great, great uh, place to, to end this, but you've been really generous with your time, Hap. Thanks for taking time to share um, I mean, your place in the, the industry and the impacts and, and the legacy. Um, I appreciate you just taking some time to, to share. Pleasure. Thank you, Chase. Of course. Mm-hmm.